Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Peter Sipp. I'm the chairman of the Surrogates Court Committee of the Richmond County Bar Association. And in that capacity, I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, very interesting program, a different program that we have today. Um, our program is uh, made in conjunction with the uh, Historical Society of the New York Courts. Uh, again, it's a uh, society I just recently become familiar with, and it's an exciting group, and they've done a lot of uh, interesting things with us. Uh, just as a, an aside, we have several exhibits in the courthouse, uh, thanks to Judge Detone. Uh, first, from the New York State Archives, there's a, an exhibit of historical interest on the first floor. And on the second floor of this building, the New York State Bar Association and the New York Women's Bar uh, uh, have a program on women's suffrage. Uh, suffrage. Before we begin, since this is a, the, about the courthouse, I'd like to uh, welcome some members of the judiciary, uh, Honorable uh, Jerry Ann Abriano, Judge Saparic from the, uh, the Court of Appeals, Catherine D. Domenico, Judge David Fry, former surrogate Robert Giganti, of course, Desmond Green, one of our panelists, Barry Kamins, Judge Letty, one of our panelists, uh, Judge McMahon, another one of our panelists, uh, Barbara Panapinto, Honorable Raja Rajaswari, Matt Serino, uh, Judge Phil Stranieri, and of course our host, uh, Matthew Titone. We also have in attendance the District Attorney of Richmond County, Mike McMahon, as well as the Public Administrator of our county, Edwina Martins. Uh, Judge Titone, as our host, may I ask you to give us just a brief? Sure. Steve, Steve as well. Sorry, Steve Fial is one of our panelists as well. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> I'm going to try to record a deed now, I'll be in trouble. But. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Sipp. Thank you all for being here. Uh, welcome to uh, uh, 18 Richmond Terrace, uh, celebrating its 100th uh, year in existence. Um, we thought it was so important to have a centennial uh, celebration. I want to thank St. Peter's High School for being here, helping to volunteer. Right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> So, um, but none of this really would have been possible, and we had a great centennial celebration. We're going to have a great CLE and a discussion uh, momentarily, but before we do that, I, I really think it's important, Judge Green thinks it's important, the centennial committee thinks it's important that we recognize and thank from the bottom of our hearts one very special person who really, really made it happen. Not you, Ron. Yeah, you, Ron. <laughs> Come on up, Ron. Thank you, Ron. And this, um, well, you can look at it first, and then we'll show it later what it is. It's, it's everyone says say thank you. <laughs> you know, the judge is giving me too much credit. I just wanted to say That's thank you to uh, everybody in this room and, and, and so many committee members that helped me uh, put put this together. It's a, like Judge Satone said. It's a labor of love, but it had to be done. It had to be recognized because this is just a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I want to just thank all the committee people and also everyone here up, up at the panel, Judge Titone, Judge Green. I, I, I really, I, I don't know what to say, but thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. Okay, just a little housekeeping. I just have to get this out that um, for the CLE portion of the uh, thing, listening to me, you will have CLE credits deducted. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Uh, before, we begin, <laughs> before we begin, I'd like to call upon uh, Stephen Younger, the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Historical Society. Steve, you have to say a few words? Good afternoon. Hopefully you don't need uh, me to yell here, right? Um, so on behalf of the Historical Society, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be in Staten Island. I always love coming here. When I was president of the bar, we had a lot of fun at the um, first time a president of the state bar had come in, what, more than 25 years? And after that, everyone followed me. But um, I want to join in today's celebration of this you know, centennial anniversary. First, I want to give my thanks to John Peter Sipp and to the whole Richmond County Bar for bringing this to fruition. Uh, Ron Seraccio, that gift looks incredible, but I know that you had so much to do with this. And, 
Thanks for kicking off this anniversary earlier this month. Um, thank you to so many members of the judiciary. Uh, Justice Green, you know, our administrative judge, thank you. Judge Titone, this beautiful courtroom. I mean, it must be really neat to preside over. Well, this, this isn't day. the courtroom. The, the courtroom's actually. Oh, the courtroom's down there? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, this beautiful library, this beautiful room. I mean, I just, just looking at that clock is extraordinary. Um, and I want to recognize Hal Kennedy. Is, Hal's, Hal's our treasurer. Um, Alice kept the Historical Society on a steady growth path and uh, watched our bank accounts, so thank you. And everybody who assembled those exhibits in the lobby, they were extraordinary, uh, just extraordinary. Um, at the Historical Society, our goal is to preserve the history of New York and its court system. And what lawyer or judge doesn't love history? And you come to a place like Staten Island, you can really appreciate it. Um, please visit our website. We're a member-based organization. Anybody can join. We, by the way, I think our judges are free, so uh, <laughs> if you want to join, it doesn't cost anything. Um, <clears throat> but today you're going to hear so much about this historic courthouse. It's architects who are responsible for the beauty that you get to share every day when you come here, why it's in the National Register of Historic Places, and why generations of lawyers have really called this courthouse their home. So on behalf of the society, I personally look forward to hearing everything that you're going to talk about this afternoon because we love to hear about influential cases in this borough, and thank you for joining us today. Okay, our program, our program this afternoon consists of two parts. Uh, the first is a historical presentation uh, by uh, Robert Piggott. Vice President, General Counsel of Phipps Houses, and Professor John Ritter, uh, Clinical Associate Professor at New York University. After their presentations, we'll have a panel discussion, as you see here, uh, discussing cases that arose in Staten Island, of uh, both of them of, of national significance. That'll be the second part. So, Mr. Pickett? I also commend an article in the November, a couple days ago, uh, by Mr. Pickett on the uh, corner Second Avenue and 14th Street. That's an very interesting case. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Marilyn Marcus and her team for including me in this program. I'm always delighted to participate in the society's programs, even when it involves taking Dramamine. <laughs> uh, I'm not a Staten Islander, but I am, or at least I was, an outer borough kid, so I hope you'll cut me a little slack. Um, we're here today on the 100th anniversary of this courthouse, but I'm going to start with how we got here. Many of you probably know that this, 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 before this courthouse, the county courthouse, was in Richmond Town. But I'm going to go back even uh, further in time than that. Uh, before Richmond Town, well, S S Staten Island became a county of New York State in 1683. And every county has a county seat, and that's where the courthouse is located. And back in 1683, the county seat was first in Stony Brook. And uh, a, a two-room structure was built there as a courthouse, a court, and a jail. But then by 1729, the county seat was moved to Richmond Town, which originally was called um, Cuckold's Town. And it's spelled with the word cuckold, and I thought there might be a good story there. But unfortunately, it, it refers to the abundance of cockles, clams, and oyster shells that were left there by Native Americans. Um, the court built a courthouse there uh, on the southeast corner of Richmond and Arthur Kill Roads. Uh, it appears to have been destroyed in the, during the American Revolution. Um, but uh, the next courthouse that was built in 1837 in the Greek Revival style uh, was um, a building that in, in, New York, in New York City, it is the oldest building, surviving building that was built as a courthouse. It was the Richmond Town Courthouse. It was also called uh, uh, the, um, the Old County Court or the Clark Avenue Court. Uh, and it was the county courthouse from the 1830s until this building was built. Um, there was, uh, here's another shot of it, and you can see just how rustic the area was at the time. I think those, those might be hitching posts in front of the courthouse. Um, there was at least one very celebrated trial that took place in that building. It was a murder trial. A woman named Polly Bodine was the defendant, and uh, she, had, uh, she was accused of 
murdering her husband's sister and niece and then setting their house on fire. And it was a sensational trial at the time. It was covered in the press by the likes of Edgar Allan Poe and P.T. Barnum. And um, the trial here uh, in, the, in the Richmond Town uh, Courthouse resulted in a hung jury and in a very rare early instance of change of forum because there was a, the, it was felt there wasn't an impart, was not an impartial jury pool, she was retried in Manhattan uh, before a courtroom that was just packed with spectators. And she was convicted in, in that Manhattan trial, and that was overturned on appeal. And there was a third trial uh, in Newburgh, and she was uh, ultimately acquitted. So Staten Island jurors ultimately did not get to uh, decide her fate. But this building here, this uh, Richmond Town uh, Courthouse, is still in existence. It's been incorporated in the Richmond Town Restoration, and it now functions as the visitor center. Uh, and as I said, it would be the county courthouse until the early 20th century when there was a move to St. George, the area where we are now. And that move was spearheaded by a man named George Cromwell, who was Staten Island's first borough president. In 1898, Staten was one of the, became one of the five boroughs that came to make up New York City. And he served as borough president from 1898 to 1913. And he spearheaded this move to St. George and the construction of a civic center here. And uh, the courthouse, that we're, the building that we're in now, um, was built between 1913 and 1919. You'll hear more about this from John Ritter, but the, uh, the firm that was responsible for building it, Carrere and Hastings, built the New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street. Uh, Carrere himself, he wasn't the architect of the building, he had died in 1911, but he was a Staten Islander, so that might, be, that might account for why Carrere and Hastings was retained to uh, design this building. And for a long time, until very recently, until you, built, you all built the courthouse on Central Avenue, this was the oldest county courthouse in New York City, 1919, older than 60 Center Street, the New York County Courthouse, uh, which was built in 1927, older than the Bronx County Courthouse, which was built in 1934, older than the Queens County Courthouse on Sutphin Boulevard out in Jamaica, 1939, and finally, the Kings County Courthouse on Adams Street in downtown Brooklyn, which was built in uh, 1958. And, but now that can't be said anymore with the construction of uh, the new courthouse, which opened, I guess, three years ago now on, uh, on Central Avenue. Um, but we'll, we'll get back to that and what changes that might mean for, mean for this building. But what I'd like to focus on is the life of a lawyer. So that you, I'm thinking of someone who had been practicing at the old Richmond Town uh, Courthouse in the very early first decade of the 20th century, and now the courthouse is moving to St. George. So what does he do? For convenience, he rents some office space nearby this new courthouse. Uh, here are some other shots of it where you can see when the, there were still exposed train tracks uh, below Re Richmond Terrace. Here's a nice shot under the snow. Um, so he, so he, he rents this office space just a block away and he thinks it's going to be nothing but convenience. And in the first month that the courthouse is built, he has a client, he files his first summons and complaint, and what do you know, on day two, the case is removed to federal court. What did that mean in 1919? Well, in 1919, it would have meant taking a ferry from St. George to Brooklyn and going to what is now Tillery Place and going to this building right here, which was the home of the Eastern District of New York. Uh, it was built as a post office and courthouse. Um, and it served as, as the home for the Eastern District of New York until the construction in the mid-1960s of a building with which many of you are probably familiar. The, uh, the building that served as the, the courthouse for the Eastern District of New York for many years from the mid-60s to the mid-90s when it was expanded with uh, the construction of this tower and now it's called the Theodore Roosevelt Courthouse. Okay, so <laughs> he, has to take, he has to take the ferry to Brooklyn, he makes a motion to remand, he gets the case back into this courthouse, he ultimately wins on summary judgment, but the other side takes an appeal. What does that mean? Back on the ferry. Uh, and it means a trip to what, it, what by then was called Brooklyn Borough Hall. And it was built as Brooklyn City Hall because at the time Brooklyn was an independent city, uh, one of the largest cities in the country, uh, fourth largest in the 18th, seventh largest in the 1860s when the courthouse was built, and ultimately the, the fourth largest before the incorporation of the, of, of the five, of five boroughs. 
So um, once again, he's back on the ferry. He, argue, he has to travel to Brooklyn, to downtown Brooklyn, to this building, and uh, to argue his appeal. If it had been a few years later, if it had been a generation later, he would have gone to this building, with which I suppose most of you are familiar, the second department uh, courthouse in Brooklyn Heights. But uh, in 1919, it still would have meant going to uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Borough Hall, where uh, in the Common Council Chamber, the appellate division sat from 1898 to 1936. Um, so, but I, but I, I would hope that you know, his, his bargain did pay off. And by and large, he was able to saunter from his, his, his offices a few blocks away to this courthouse and uh, happily retire probably sometime in the 1950s. Um, and, but, he, but he would occasionally have needed to go to Brooklyn. Now, I'd like to move on to some other courthouses on Staten Island. Uh, before, 19, before 1962 and amendments to the New York State Constitution, there were scattered all over the city small municipal courts and magistrates courts for small civil and criminal cases, and there were several on Staten Island. Uh, one of them was, uh, in a building called uh, the New Brighton Village Hall. And um, from personal experience, I can tell you that if you don't live in Staten Island, do not get on your bike and bicycle all the way to Staten Island Ferry. Take the ferry, bicycle into the heart of Staten Island looking for this building because it is not there. Uh, and then you might wonder how it's not there because it got landmark status. It was given landmark status. How could it be that it was torn down? Well, unfortunately, and this is something the, the Landmark Commission is better at preventing now than it was uh, a few years ago, the owner of the building had la allowed it to fall into such disrepair that ultimately it had to be torn down. Uh, so it was a, a landmark building that unfortunately was torn down, this old New Brighton Village Hall, which functioned as a municipal court. Another small courthouse on Staten Island was the Edgewater Village Hall in Tappan Park. And if you go there, there's a plaque that reads, this structure was built in 1889 as a municipal and city magistrate's courthouse, originally serving the village of Edgewater. This Romanesque revival hall is a superb example of the Victorian architecture that has admirably fulfilled the civic needs of the community. And that building is still there. You can see it and go in it. And then uh, there were another series of courthouses that were built in the late 20s and early 30s. And curiously, I don't know what kind of in this architectural firm had, but the firm of Sibley and Featherston seemed to have a monopoly on Staten Island courthouses at that time and built three courthouses on the island in just a span of about three or four years. One was the Stapleton Courthouse, uh, which was a criminal court, which was built in 1930. Um, and it was on Targhee Street, uh, and it housed municipal and magistrates' courts, and uh, now it actually has uh, some criminal parts in it. I don't know if that's still true with the, with the construction of your new courthouse. No attempt to bring it What? It's vacant right now. It's vacant right now. Oh. Did any knowledge of what the plans for it are? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another building built in 1929, the Civil Courthouse. Um, at 927 Castleton Avenue, another Sibley and Featherston building. Um, and it was built at a cost of $275,000. And it too originally housed municipal and magistrates' courts. Um, and now it's, a, it's still a civil courthouse. Yes. yes. Uh, so that's for those of you who are not practitioners, if you have a relatively small case where it's, is it 25,000, is that the jurisdictional cap? Uh, you bring your case there rather than Supreme Court. And then finally, uh, the family court, which is just a couple blocks away here on Richmond Terrace at 100. Uh, it was built as the children's court at the time in 1931. Um, and it's still standing and still carrying out that function. So with the, with the construction of this new courthouse uh, on Central Avenue, you have to wonder what is the fate of this building. And certainly it meant a lot of parts moved around and things are different than they were. Uh, to get a sense of what the fate of this building might be, let's look at what happened in the other, five, in the other four boroughs. Uh, in Brooklyn, in the late 50s, when they built uh, the Kings County, uh, uh, Kings County Courthouse, they tore down the, 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 the court that existed before then, a building that had built in the 1860s on Jerolamon Street, this domed building here. And as you can see, they tore it down when they built the current Kings County Courthouse in the late 1950s. 
in Queens County when they built this building in the late 1930s, which was a, became a reasonable place for a courthouse when the IND subway had been built so you could take the subway all the way out to Hillside Avenue and Sutphin Boulevard. When this building was built, thankfully, the prior, uh, the prior county courthouse in Long Island City was preserved, and that still uh, is, is used for several parts of the Supreme Court. Uh, in the Bronx, when this building was built in the mid-1930s, uh, for a while, the predecessor building, which was the Brooklyn Borough Courthouse on 3rd Avenue, and by the way, this building, you pro this building here, you, you may have seen it if you're ever at Yankee Stadium, you can see it from the stands. Um, it, it, uh, it's described very, very vividly in the book Bonfire of the Vanities by the author Tom Wolfe. But this building was built, and happily, they did not tear down this building on 3rd Avenue and 163rd Street. This, was, this photo was taken at a time when there was still an elevated subway running up 3rd Avenue in the Bronx, no longer true. And, but the building lay vacant for many, many years and uh, fell into great disrepair, but fortunately it was bought a couple of years ago by a charter school, which is renovated. And, uh, I think they may have already opened or they're just completing their renovations. And in New York County, when 60 Center Street was built in 1927, that, re that replaced, functionally at least, the Tweed Courthouse on Chambers Street. We could spend 20 minutes just talking about the Tweed Courthouse. A uh, very interesting uh, building, but there was not a lot of affection for it because of all the associations with the, um, uh, the corruption of Boss Tweed, which was, uh, resulted in its, its construction. And repeatedly over time, there have been talks of tearing it down. But happily, it seems to be, uh, it seems to be clear that it is going to survive now. The New York uh, Mayor Bloomberg installed the Department of Education in that building. And there, too, actually, there's a charter school in that building as well. So that building isn't going in anywhere either. So that's encouraging for the fate of this building. Um, before, before and after, I guess before the new courthouse was built, this building had parts of the Supreme Court and the Surrogates Court. There was some overflow in, Bur in Borough Hall, I believe, and uh, obviously the the, 20, the Central Avenue Courthouse didn't exist yet. With the construction of this building, uh, the Supreme Court is largely gone except for some matrimonial parts. But it's, so now it's primarily the Surrogates Court Courthouse. There still are some parts, I understand, in, 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 in Borough Hall of the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court and the Criminal Court is largely uh, in the new building on Central Avenue. So I, from all that, I would say this building has a, a very long future. And uh, you can invite me back, maybe not for the second centennial, but maybe the, <laughs> maybe the 125th anniversary. Uh, I'll give you an update. You can, I'll be 85. You can wheel me in. And I'll be delighted to come, come back and speak to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. John Ritter, and uh, as I think it was announced, I'm a professor of art history at New York University, and I specialize in architectural history, so I'm here also, like Bob, to talk a little bit about the history of the, the building and the, um, uh, the idea of, uh, what, of, of a civic center, which um, I don't know if you call this area that we're in the civic center, do you? Would you refer to this area as the civic center? I don't know if you would. In 1919, when the um, building was opened, it certainly would have been recognized as a kind of a civic center, combining together, of course, the borough hall, uh, this courthouse, and there was, as I'll show you, an ambition to develop a kind of line of buildings uh, along Richmond Terrace, including, uh, well, of course, the, uh, the police headquarters was eventually built there and the children's court, but there were plans for um, a museum and open gardens and a kind of civic um, uh, ensemble of buildings and spaces. The guy you see on the upper uh, left there is uh, uh, gesticulating toward this uh, diagram of the five boroughs together. There's a guy called Andrew Haswell Green, who some of you may know. Uh, he's often considered to be the father of Greater New York. He was the commissioner of Central Park uh, in the 1870s, 1880s, uh, and campaigned for a couple of decades around the idea that for um, reasons of efficiency and municipal um, uh, governance and administration, it would be uh, efficacious to join together these independent boroughs into the greater New York. And uh, despite some resistance, especially from the, uh, the city of Brooklyn, which then became the borough of Brooklyn, among, other, uh, among others, uh, this was uh, in 1898 made into the law of the land. And we have the development of this kind of consolidated borough system. And so there then necessitated the idea to build city, uh, what had been borough halls, turn them into city halls, or, or create um, administrative uh, centers in each borough, as well as a kind of central civic center
center at Foley Square uh, that became the kind of administrative center of all of New York City. And um, so certainly I think the genesis of this building and the complex of buildings uh, that was planned for the area should be understood in the context of this idea of trying to preserve a kind of identity of Staten Island, but also connect it more broadly to the larger complex of, of this project of a New York City, right? Um, and so uh, along with green there, you see, of course, um, in the upper right, your, uh, the Borough Hall, which uh, was built then uh, in 1902 uh, to 1906 by the same architects that designed this building, so Carrere and Hastings, I'll come back to them, but they designed also the Borough Hall next door in a slightly different style, and I'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, and then below that, um, you see an image of the, the, the so-called Court of Honor or the um, Triumphal Archway that is the entry to the Manhattan Bridge uh, from, uh, from, from Canal Street, right? And that was also designed by Carrere and Hastings, again, uh, the firm that designed this building, the Borough Hall, and a number of other buildings, including actually four uh, New York Public Library buildings in Staten Island. And of course, on the lower left, the central New York Public Library building, also designed by Carrere and Hastings. And again, as Bob said, Carrere lived in Staten Island, knew Cromwell personally, was involved in kind of civic organizations in Staten Island, and so clearly was uh, a, a, a major figure to, uh, to lead this kind of civic architectural um, construction project for Staten Island. Also, by the way, Carrere and Hastings also built the original uh, ferry terminal as well. So, right, so they had a big hand in developing a kind of sense of the public architecture, the public face of, of what Staten Island was going to be in the 20th century, but also then connecting it to this larger idea of New York City, connecting it to, uh, again, through these tri triumphal arches, the idea of new infrastructures of bridges that would connect Manhattan to Brooklyn, right? Uh, ferry terminals that would connect Manhattan to Staten Island. Uh, central nodes of administration and kind of public architecture at borough halls at Foley Square Civic Center that would suggest the presence of a kind of centralized municipal administration. Um, and this was a dream of um, uh, architects, planners, and politicians around what's sometimes termed uh, the so-called City Beautiful Movement, which emerged in the late 19th century around ideas of, uh, again, elaborating a kind of civic identity through a kind of neoclassical, Bo Beaux-Arts, we might say, neoclassical or neo-Renaissance architectural form. And, and I'll come back and talk more about that. I know I'm an art historian, right? So I'm interested in images, I'm interested in styles. Uh, you know, uh, I'll refer to them a little bit, but not get deeply into those. Uh, but I think we can recognize, you can certainly recognize, of course, the kind of uh, classical motifs in this room, in this building, in this collection of, of buildings that suggest a sense, as the classical often does, of a kind of permanence, a kind of solidity, a kind of legitimacy, uh, building on the reputation and the historical uh, achievements right, of the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome um, and the Renaissance and antiquity. So the, the classical forms are very often uh, successfully deployed in public buildings uh, as a way to suggest this kind of um, authority and, and permanence, right? And I'll talk more about that. So um, in terms of this, this larger project of the idea of turning this, um, this section of, of St. George into a kind of civic center. Um, uh, the, it's clear that this building, the Borough Hall, were conceived of by Borough President um, Cromwell, as you see here in this New York Times article. Uh, they were conceived of as part of a larger project, an aspiration to develop an entire, again, kind of municipal precinct here on the riverfront facing Manhattan. Um, directly um, up the hill from the, the ferry uh, terminus, right? So this idea of kind of creating uh, an architectural greeting, a kind of architectural ensemble that you would be the first thing you would see when you came into Staten Island would suggest, again, this municipal presence of, of government, of authority, of, um, of political and legal right uh, order in, in the borough and in the city, and then connecting again with these other sites of municipal and legal order and authority in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Queens, in, um, in Manhattan. So what you see there is, uh, the only plan that we have uh, that suggests what Cromwell was thinking about. And you can see, uh, going from the upper left there, uh, you see the, uh, the, the, the library, which I believe is just up the hill here. Again, it was a Carnegie Library and branch of the New York Public Library designed by Carrere and Hastings. I think I have an image of it on the next slide. So on the, on the right there, you can see that is the, uh, on the top, the uphill side, and on the bottom, the downhill side, right, of the library, designed again by Carrere and Hastings in 1907, that opened. Um, Okay, so coming back to the, the image before, so that's on the upper left. Then, of course, on the, on the left, at the, uh, all the way to the left there, below the library is the Borough Hall, right? Then moving to the, to the right, uh, you have the, um, the, the building we're in, right? The, uh, the, the courthouse, and in between, of course, the courthouse and the Borough Hall, you have a kind of plaza or an open uh, landscape, right? And I'll come back to that. Uh, it's a kind of garden terrace, right? That is an intermediate step between the upper and lower uh, landscape here, right? So we'll come back to that. So then moving uh, 
along to the right, the plan of things that was never built, right? So in the middle there would have been a federal building and post office that was conceived of but never built. Those were eventually developed by private developers, right? There's an apartment building there, I believe, and some stores and shops and offices. Then the next block was designed to have a, a Staten Island Museum that was anticipated. I think there was a small building that was built there later in the 30s as a museum on the upper part of that block, uh, but originally it was conceived of as part of an ensemble of buildings. And then moving along, you see another kind of terraced open space and uh, a, a plan for what was eventually built there, the children children's court or the family court that was built there also in the late 20s, I believe, was also conceived again in 1912. And then moving on finally to that kind of um, triangular corner at the very end on the right would have been a kind of open space that in the plan uh, Cromwell talks about could it be a place for a, a public market or an open space or a recreational field or some kind of use. Um, you can see throughout the architect, the spatial form is a kind of axial uh, system of, of, of squares and rectangles that have clear um, uh, the, again, axial spaces uh, between them as you move through in a very kind of classical, symmetrical, uh, geometric type of planning that, again, derives from Renaissance and, and Roman kind of architectural planning that Carrere uh, and Hastings would have been very aware of. They were both educated at, um, uh, uh, in, in part, in Europe, in France, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, and would have known uh, the classical systems of order, proportion, ratio, and geometry that govern buildings uh, and, and which govern, in fact, the, the interior and exterior volumes of this building in various ways, again, harking back to classical traditions of architectural design, which I won't bore you with today, but if, I could tell you more about if you're interested. Um, okay, so this image again shows you on the on the right, you know, the, the public library of Carrere and Hastings. On the left, again, the Borough Hall, which I imagine you're familiar with, our neighbor uh, just over here. Um, some sources for the Borough Hall um, would, in, okay, so again, here, just um, another image showing on the bottom, of course, the uh, uh, the plan I just showed you from the New York Times of the, con the conception of the Civic Center, and above that, 1917, a, a, a land use map that shows, in fact, the library on the upper left, the borough hall, uh, the building we're in now, and then you can see to the right, again, the, um, the, the commercial buildings that developed slowly on that site. Um, and you're more familiar with this, I'm sure, than I am, uh, being uh, residents of, of the borough here, at least I assume most of you are. Um, on the left, again, the borough hall. So we can see a precedent for this in the work, again, of Carrera and Hastings. They had designed and well, a decade earlier in Patterson, New Jersey, a city hall that looks somewhat similar, especially with its tower um, that uh, functions here as, I think, in Staten Island as a kind of beacon, right? Again, it's something that um, creates a greater visibility from the water on the one side as you approach this tower with its clock, and then from the coming from uh, above, from Staten Island down that uh, boulevard that leads into the Borough Hall, it also suggests a kind of centrality and axis, a kind of um, uh, a beacon that, that visually suggests the presence of the, of the government, right, at that site. Um, another precedent for this building stylistically, and it's interesting stylistically, I would say that it uh, draws on a kind of French um, Northern Renaissance uh, style, right? Uh, we can see a uh, family resemblance, I would say, to in Manhattan, the contemporary building or a little bit earlier building of the uh, surrogates court there, uh, just across from the Tweed Courthouse that Bob mentioned before. Uh, yeah, I draw your attention to that central portico with its giant sort of oversized columns and cornice and the tall, uh, what we call mansarded, we would say, French roof, that steep uh, slate roof with the dormer windows poking out through it. Uh, clearly here there was an uh, intimation of a kind of again, French um, civic form. And this, there would have been a precedent for this in the development of French city hall buildings, um, as well as private chateaus, but uh, the Marie and Hotel de uh, Particulaire and Hotel de Ville in France, which would have been um, a, 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 an example of a kind of uh, decentralized municipal administration in France, right? That in some ways uh, the um, uh, uh, progressive era politicians were thinking about when they were developing this system of civic centers that would handle legal and judicial uh, and governmental functions at the local level in different municipalities and different neighborhoods as this uh, Staten Island building would do. So there's a sense here I think also of a kind of interconnection of the boroughs, right? The idea of what's happening in Manhattan architecturally is recognizable in Staten Island. So I think that's where Carrere and Hastings were trying to make those visual connections uh, as well as those historical connections with French precedent. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the building that we're in, the courthouse that we're now uh, celebrating the centennial of, as we can see there in the overhead uh, view, the area of view on the left, um, uh, again, the, the wrapping, the courthouse wrapping around and creating that internalized kind of um, plaza or park terrace space between the volume of the, uh, the borough hall and the, uh, the, the courthouse itself. Um, and, and of course, also the, uh, 
the, the front facing facade there of a, a columned kind of portico really re recalling the Greek Greco-Roman temple front, right? Um, and here, I would say more purely classical than the borough hall next door, uh, which is again more French Renaissance Northern kind of um, uh, uh, hotel uh, or Marie style. Instead here, especially again on the lower right, we have this image of a kind of powerful uh, distillation of the classical form into the kind of um, uh, it, the image of that Greek temple that, 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 that faces again toward Manhattan, toward the city, and picks up a more um, distilled neoclassicism that became in fact fashionable in the second decade of the 20th century. So what you're also picking up here in the kind of stylistic difference between the two buildings is a shift from a more kind of eclectic uh, use of the French uh, provincial precedents, uh, Northern Renaissance president precedents, toward a much more um, purely Renaissance Roman kind of image of what we call the Beaux-Arts form or style in, in architectural jargon, if you will. And again, I, I don't want to belabor that here for, for you. If, you. if you're interested in learning more about it, I can tell you more. Um, OK, so now let me uh, end or, or do the second half of my lecture around kind of putting this in a larger context of this, this civic center movement, I would say. So around this time, uh, starting the late 19th century into the early 20th century, it became very common, not only in Staten Island, Brooklyn, Manhattan, but all across the United States to develop these projects of these so-called civic centers, which uh, aspire to group together uh, municipal buildings, governmental buildings, municipal, federal, and state buildings um, in recognizable kind of ensembles that would shape space, uh, suggest, again, a lot of the things I said about the, the Staten Island project, right, create a kind of visual identity, a kind of efficiency of grouping together uh, judicial, legal, um, uh, and office kind of administrative functions all in the same place in the city, uh, combining them. And the idea for this really came from largely the ideas that were introduced by a Chicago architect called Daniel Burnham, uh, who actually worked often in collaboration with John um, Carrere. So Carrere, here from Staten Island, uh, was connected to these national movements through his collaborations with Daniel Burnham, who again is the Chicago architect, probably to us best known as his firm did the Flatiron Building on 23rd Street uh, here in, in Manhattan. Uh, but he was most, no most known in his lifetime probably as the director of works overseeing the uh, Chicago World's Fair of 1893, the World's Columbian Exposition, which was hugely famous in its day. It's said that um, one in 10 Americans attended it. Uh, it was well known, and it provided a kind of model of this kind of unified neoclassical architectural form in these buildings I'm showing you at the top of this slide. Um, this kind of ensemble of, again, Greco-Roman inspired buildings that surrounded the central lagoon of the World's Fair was the first thing that you saw when you came into the fair and it kind of enveloped you and created a sense of very European inflected harmonious um, architectural form. Uh, these are individual buildings designed by individual architects but they cohere together to create a sense of order, um, uh, coordination, right, architecturally, but also stability, permanence, legitimacy, again, the things I sketched before about the just kind of symbolic meanings of the classical tradition. And this became very influential in architects, patrons, uh, and politicians in terms of their aspiration for how to rebuild uh, American cities in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And, and Burnham, I'm just showing on the bottom, uh, and Carrere also went on to work in Washington, D.C. to develop or, or redevelop um, the plan of the, the plan that had been sort of the lost original Baroque plan of Washington, D.C. and its central axis of a mall and coordinated buildings around it. Um, and so in 1901 forward, they work on uh, redeploying or re-emphasizing that, that system of federal presence in Washington, D.C. that became very influential, again, on municipalities, local architects, builders, and uh, kind of progressive era politicians who began to design projects for civic centers all around the country. So here you see a number of examples at the top left, again, the kind of example of the World's Fair of 1893 that gets deployed in places like Cleveland, uh, where Carrere also worked with Burnham as a consultant to develop this idea of a plan, which essentially is, as you can see, a central landscaped mall um, surrounded by municipal buildings, city hall, courthouse, post office, federal building, um, a board of education, and a municipal theater kind of uh, on the upper left there, defining a kind of, again, civic realm, a civic presence of unified um, neoclassical buildings. On the lower left, similar idea in St. Louis. On the lower right, just to show you that these didn't just exist on paper, uh, we see an image of the uh, kind of final project or almost final project in San Francisco, where you see at the head the neoclassical domed city hall, again, surrounding a kind of axial mall or open space that itself is surrounded by a series of state buildings, public library, uh, municipal auditorium, and other kind of municipal and civic buildings. 
things. Uh, so this became a very common practice in American cities. Many of these plans remained on paper. Uh, the Cleveland project, about half of it got built. Parts of the St. Louis project got built. Uh, in, in, and again, Carrere from Staten Island is involved not only in, St. Louis, in, in, in Cleveland, but also in uh, uh, Cleveland as well in, in a similar project. Um, Daniel Burnham, the leader of the kind of movement, uh, is best known probably for his plan of Chicago of 1909, where again he proposes uh, the idea of a kind of massive central city hall that you see on the bottom uh, that would uh, be the tallest building that would radiate kind of municipal presence all across the city. And you could see that the idea was to create it at the head of a kind of node um, in the center of the city from which the streets of the city would radiate out uh, and then would contain within this uh, space a kind of again collection of municipal and civic buildings, courthouses, cultural buildings, uh, city hall, etc. Um, and we can see here, if we just sum up the idea of what this civic center could be and what indeed I think the aspiration of this Richmond Terrace project was, uh, if you just look at the part that I've outlined there in yellow, um, this is a, 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 an address to a, a conference of city planners in 1916 by Arnold Brunner, a New York architect who had co co collaborated with Carrere many times. And it says, um, uh, the civic center is where the city speaks to us, uh, where it asserts itself. Here, the streets meet and agree to submit to regulation. And of course, the idea of regulation, there's a metaphor there, of course, of municipal and civic regulation as well of all aspects of, of life, right? Um, they, the streets, resolve themselves into some regular form. The buildings stop swearing at each other. Uh, can, uh, competition is forgotten. Individuals are no longer rivals, they are all citizens. So there you see the ideal of the architectural form shaping the social and political form of, 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 of citizenship, of, um, of cooperation rather than individualistic vying with one another, and the idea that these spaces uh, could create this kind of image of order. Um, and municipal presence. Um, and, and again, just some images here that show that this became very quickly a kind of orthodoxy of urban planning. You can see on the upper left a kind of high school civics text, which shows this kind of proper way to plan cities, again, around this idea of a central landscaped um, uh, space surrounded by municipal and civic buildings. And on the right, uh, a collection of a number of these projects uh, that have been developed and, and are outlined there in a, a major planning text of the 1930s. Um, so, um, and they get in New York City, again, as, as Bob mentioned, uh, we see the development of this idea at Foley Square. Um, I won't go into it deeply, but you can see on the upper right there, um, uh, again, this uh, cropped photo which suggests a kind of order and regularity of that space, again, which is only about half built. If you look at it the right way, you do get a sense that you're in a kind of Roman forum or a Greek agora. You're in the space of civic public participation, democracy of, again, all the things that these buildings entail. Um, and indeed, I think this was the ideal of what uh, was being anticipated here in Staten Island. Um, if uh, um, I think my, my next slide is very large and taking a moment to load, uh, but um, the, um, uh, clearly, again, Carrere uh, in designing this building in this kind of neoclassical mode and thinking about the way it could relate to the Borough Hall next door and this line of buildings that was anticipated for the neighborhood was really trying to imagine that this could uh, also fulfill this ideal of a kind of, um, uh, uh, again, city beautiful aspiration to architectural form which would inform a kind of a collective civic and cultural form there. Again, the idea that, um, and I just should say that without going deeply into the Foley Square project, the original idea on the left by architect Guy Lowell was to build the New York County Courthouse, which is now that, uh, that hexagonal building that you may know on Foley Square. The original idea was to build it as a round building, a rotunda building, that would appear, as it was said by the New York Times, to be like the Colosseum, like the Roman Colosseum, a spectacle of justice in the center of the, the streets of New York City. And indeed, we might think that Carrere, with his, Greek temple might have been thinking about this kind of, uh, these, these buildings facing one another, right? Facing down Center Street, Lowell's Coliseum of the county courthouse, and Carrere thinking about his temple of justice, right? This building facing down the hill toward uh, central Manhattan in a sense of this, um, this, this discourse or dialectic of, of the classical authority of, of, of legal systems that the, they were trying to articulate through their architectural projects. Um, and so finally, again, I think that I pretty much said, made my points here and shown you the uh, kind of lineage of, of how this building and its space uh, develops within a larger context of, of classical idealism in architectural form in the late 19th century. Um, and um, I think I've expended my time, so I won't go further, but we might make some connection to uh, Sailor Snug Hard and its uh, line of Greek revival buildings also in terms of informing perhaps the ideas that were inherent here and this idea of a line of civic buildings on, on St. George uh, a century ago. So thank you for your attention. And <laughs> Uh, 
thank both of our speakers. Uh, and we work in these buildings and we walk past them every day. But you've given us a different perspective and a, a, a very interesting presentations of both of them. Uh, thank you both. We're going to start our panel discussion. Uh, call first upon uh, Steve Fiala, our county clerk, to give a brief address. I'm not limiting you, but Thank you, Mr. Sip. I have the easy job of building a bridge between this wonderful presentation we just heard and the great presentation we're about to hear. I, uh, I want to say that uh, in thinking about framing remarks last night, I thought about our civilization. You know, we're, we live in a republic that's pretty old. And, in a civilization as highly evolved and as old as our republic, we can sometimes, and I would posit to you, we often do get lost in the complex web and bureaucratic mazes of civic institutions, forgetting the very foundational principles and values which gave rise to those institutions in the first place. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity to pause briefly and take stock in assessing how we're faring in living up to those principles and values. The centennial celebration of this, the fourth county courthouse, a building which looms very large on the Staten Island landscape and represents in both symbolic and practical fashion alike those foundational ideals which upon our civilization rest is a unique once in a century opportunity, and we get to share in that today. One of my favorite authors, J.K. Chesterton said, America is only, or America is the only country founded on a creed. So what is that? It means those enduring values and principles which serve as the foundational pillars and columns supporting the bold experiment of a self-governing republic. And just like those magnificent Corinthian columns over my shoulder on the face of this courthouse, which support the pediment of this building, think of those foundational values as being held up by those ancient inspired columns out front, holding up and supporting them. And what are those enduring values? Freedom, equality, democracy, and justice. Think of those columns as supporting those core values. Strip away the complex web and bureaucratic mazes that we often get trapped in when we're on the ground, for we know that when you're in a maze, you're incapable of seeing the whole picture. You're incapable of seeing the beauty of the very thing that you are in. So we'd like you to join us today in rising above the maze and gazing down upon it from on high. And hopefully, hopefully, you'll get a glimpse of the simple beauty that this complex structure that we're sitting in today supports. For you see, in the final analysis, this building, like its predecessors and its successors to come, is far more than a physical structure. It's far more than the people who work in it, it's far more than the lawyers and litigants who frequent its halls. And it's more than any single case that gets adjudicated within its walls. This building is an enduring statement of hope, and it's a commitment to a purpose. Every generation gets to leave to posterity the hope that the republic that they inherited themselves and may be improved upon themselves will continue to survive and thrive for their children, their grandchildren, and all the grandchildren to come. This building's purpose, therefore, is to serve as a sentry, as a guardian, protecting against the threats to our foundational and always aspirational values, those pillars of freedom, democracy, equality, and justice. In poetic terms, I like to think She's like a prayer, and her columns hold up not only the pediments of a facade, but hold up and hold up high 
reaching all the way into the sky and up to heaven, the virtues of the creed that Chesterton was talking about. Before I transition to our distinguished panel, just a few tidbits of historical interest that I hope interest some of you. In these walls over the last hundred years, millions of footsteps have happened. But a lot of it you might not be familiar with. This building once housed the district attorney's office in addition to the courts, in, in addition to the courts, the county clerk's office in addition to the courts. There were on not infrequent days, thousands of people lined up outside this building. On one day, the Staten Island Advance reports, down Richmond Terrace, up the hill, around the building, over 8,500 people dressed in their finest, wearing hats and ties and wearing dresses because they were coming in to see the county clerk to get their license and their uh, driver's license. Because back then, the county clerk was also the commissioner of motor vehicles. This building saw election functions, because back then that was also under the purview. This building regularly engaged veterans who came into its doors to obtain licenses and to file their papers so that they could get their benefits. This building has seen great figures who have gone on in other aspects of public life to do great things. This building witnessed, for example, a young man named Ralph Lamberti. Is Chief Mara here? He was going to be here. I thought he would appreciate this. Ralph Lamberti, a young man, walks in many years back, goes into the county clerk's office and gets hired as the title was laborer. And he worked in the motor vehicles office. And the thing that he's proud of, he says, I signed your book, Steve, back then. You weren't the county clerk, but I had to take the oath. And if you go back to that date, you'll see my name. You'll see I took the oath, and I was proudly given the job of laborer. Fast forward, and Ralph Lamberti took the oath again, signed the same book. But this time, his office was next door, and he was serving as Staten Island's chief executive, the borough president of Richmond County. This building housed a man named Judge Tatone the First, <laughs> who went on, as you know, to be the only person from the county to serve on the Court of Appeals, and has a litany of cases under his belt that few can match. But think about it, fast forward, years later his son would make history and become another first. Judge Giganti, you were the sixth, I believe, surrogate. Judge Tatone, you were the seventh, right? And you are the first. There's a lot of lineage here. This building housed citizens, would-be citizens, who came in and saw the Statue of Liberty, and then when it was time to take the oath of office, they came to the county clerk or a Supreme Court judge in this building, raised their hand and took the oath of citizenship. We no longer do that in these courthouses. It's handled by the federal courts. But think about the thousands and thousands who walked through that door and became the very thing that we're blessed to be today. And finally, this building, by the way, that would have happened in a courtroom, probably a courtroom that Judge Tatone sat in downstairs before he was elevated. And that courtroom, fast forward a few years, not a few, many. Another first, the first female administrative judge of the county presided on that bench. This panel that I'm about to transition you to, they're all first. Our administrative judge, Desmond Green, Justice McMahon, surrogate to tone, and we have a historian extraordinaire who you all know. They've all been first at something, and we're blessed today to be able to pause and think about what this building means beyond its bricks and mortar and concrete. So with that, Mr. Sipp, I turn it back over and thank you for the invite. A nice philosophy lesson and it's excellent. So we have uh, our panel here today to discuss a couple of cases that arose in uh, this county, in this courtroom, in courthouse. Um, and we have Judge Letty, Dan Letty, 
because our host, Judge Tatone, whose father figured prominently in both of the cases we're going to discuss, uh, Desmond Green and, and Judge McMahon. So, uh, Professor Letty, I'll let you start. Please. Thank you. I want you all to know that I had hair back when I handled this case, I see. And those kids back there should pay attention because both of these cases involve schools and school kids. So that uh, it was very difficult trying to select cases that uh, were representative. We had so many important cases came through these Holland Halls through the years. But two cases in particular involved students and involve constitutional issues that endure to this day. The, the issues continue to be replayed over and over again. Let me take you back on the first case, which is called NISTAD against the Board of Education, which, believe it or not, was handled 50 years ago by a lawyer with hair. Um, I was just out of law school, and it was the era of the Vietnam War. And uh, for those of you who remember, and I guess many of you do, some of you may not, it was a very contentious time in our country. And um, if we think today, the, the, the discord in the political sphere, it was just as bad back then, maybe even worse, given the Vietnam War. Now, um, thousands and thousands of American troops were being killed in Vietnam. A lot of people were wondering what we were doing there. On the other hand, a lot of people felt we should be there. Our, our national interest was at stake. And there was a tremendous battle going on philosophically and politically. Against that background, on October 15th, 1969, the New York City Board of Education declared that all students in public schools here who wanted to attend a planned war memoratorium, October 15th, it was going to be a, a special day designated to protest the war in Vietnam. Any student in a public school who wanted to be absent that day to attend the war moratorium protest in the city would be allowed to be absent without any penalty. Same thing with teachers. However, if the student supported the war in Vietnam, then in fact the student was required to attend school. Now, against this background comes in James Nistad, who was a middle school student over at IS 27, um, then called Junior High School 27, and his mom. And they come in to see me, and um, James was only interested in the Mets, by the way, because they were in the middle of trying to win the pennant. That year. It, was, it, was, it was October, see, 1969, and the Mets are, you know, they're coming down. They got Seaver and Kuzman and Gentry, and they're moving ahead, right? So he doesn't really care about this, but the mom does. And, and, yeah, and, and, and her argument, and, and she's very much opposed to her son being put in the position of having to take a stand on the Vietnam War. Now, if you think about it, if you think about it, the child is being told this. If you support the war, you have to go to school. If you don't support the war, you can go out and protest on the moratorium. So the child, in effect, is being forced to speak not with his word, not with his mouth, not with a pen, but with his actions. He's required to, speech, to speak. Now, conversely, you could have children who would be sick that day. Maybe a child, for example, who was, uh, supported the war, but he's home sick. But he's not in school, not because he supports the war, but because he's, he's sick. Nevertheless, he could be deemed to be opposing the war simply because he's not in school that day. So um, we initiated an Article 78 proceeding in the nature of mandamus. For those lawyers out there, that's the, as you know, that's the statutory embodiment of the old common law writ of mandamus against the Board of Education, seeking an order directing them to rescind this directive and to have a regular school day uh, on uh, October 15th and not permit students to take time off. So we go before Judge Tatone, um, the distinguished surrogate. Gee, you look good. I'm not that old. <laughs> he was six years old, I think, at the time. Or, or, Genius. Or, the, or, the, or, the, or thereabout, you know? And um, so uh, Judge Tatone wrote in an opinion um, as follows. I'm going to quote part of it. And by the way, our argument was based on the First and Fourteenth Amendment, the First Amendment's free speech clause, which, of course, not only do you have a right to speak, but a right not to speak, okay? It is embodied in the First Amendment. And the Fourteenth Amendment, because the First Amendment is channeled and becomes applicable to the states via the due process clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. 
So Judge Tatone writes this way, the element of compulsion is clear. Students and teachers who do not attend school that day will be deemed to be against the government's Vietnam War policy, and those who attend will be assumed to favor such policy. It forces people to take a position when, as a matter of constitutional law, they are not required to. Now, Judge Tatone issued an order directing the Board of Education to rescind that directive and to allow the schools to function on a normal basis and not force a student, in effect, to take a stand on the war by virtue of whether they attend school or don't attend school. But it goes beyond all that. The and Judge Tatone referred to this in his decision. The real problem at the heart of what the Board of Education did is this. The Board of Education took unto itself the right to decide what issue is worth or worthy of this deference. In other words, they decided this war moratorium protest was worthy of deference. Suppose, for example, you had had, let's say, a march to oppose abortion, for example. Would they have allowed students to take off for that? Would they have allowed stu uh, female students to take off for a march on Washington for women's rights? Where do you draw the line? When does the Board of Education, does the Board of Education really have a right to speak and to, and to, and to, and to decide what the great issues of the day are? Now, in that regard, Judge Tatone cited, in his opinion, a landmark decision from the U.S. Supreme Court in the case of West Virginia against Barnett. This is a 1943 decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, written, um, I believe, by Justice Jackson, wrote the majority opinion. And in that case, what happened was a school district had required students in the public schools to salute the flag each day before school. Now, a group of Jehovah Witness kids objected to that. And the school responded by saying that they had an obligation to follow the rules of the school, which required the salute. And if they didn't follow those, school, those rules, they would be deemed to be insubordinate and duly punished. So the Jehovah Witnesses students filed suit against this policy. And the Supreme Court, in a 7-2 decision, um, written, as I said, by Justice Jackson, said that the, that the policy violated the students' First and Fourteenth Amendment rights because, again, it was compelling them to speech that they, they didn't have an obligation to, to, uh, to, to, to do. And this is what, if I'm, I'm going to read you one short passage from Judge Murphy's concurring opinion in that case. He said, the right of freedom of thought and of religion is guaranteed by the Constitution against state action. It includes both the right to speak freely and the right to refrain from speaking at all, except in so far as essential operations of government may require it for the preservation of an orderly society, as in the case of compulsion to give evidence in court. To many, it is simply distasteful to join in the public chorus of affirmation of private belief. So in other words, it's not the business of government, whether it be the school system or any other arm of government, to decide what the great issues of the day are and then to compel subordinates to take a stand on those issues. So that was Judge Tatone's ruling in, in, uh, in Nistat against the Board of Education. And I think Judge McMahon is going to speak a little bit about uh, Yes, yep. okay, thank you. Uh, initially, I want to thank everybody for being here, and uh, I must say that um, I started in this building on May 29th, 1990, and, uh, and, I, and to echo what uh, Chief Clerk uh, uh, Steve Payala said, this building is so much more than any case, any person, any judge, any litigant. This is a building where people come and seek justice and equality. And it is my firm belief, after being here for a few decades, that this is what people receive when they walk into these doors. And uh, I'm just very proud to be uh, part of this panel and, uh, and part of this, of this building. Uh, in addition to that, so yesterday, when I found out that I was going to be on the panel, I, I, said to, I said to myself, what could I possibly add when Judge Letty, who represented the petitioners in each of these cases, 
that we will be discussing. What could I possibly add? He knows every innuendo, every story, uh, all the parties. Uh, so I said to myself, well, obviously I have to kind of think outside the box. And what I did is, well, how, how are these cases that were so uh, beautifully written and so, uh, so, so, so cogently and aptly argued, uh, how, how can, uh, what, are they do, what are we doing today? And how does it affect us today? So, as everybody knows, just this past September, uh, the New York City Board of, uh, of Education initially was allowing students to um, leave their classrooms with their teachers to, uh, to uh, uh, participate in uh, climate change protests. So uh, I think what happened there is that uh, the teachers initially were going to use it as a, as a class trip to go on to, to the protests. And I think, and I would like to say because of uh, Judge Letty and Judge Tatone and this particular case of Neistat, uh, two days prior to, um, uh, to the protest, the City Board of Education changed their stance. And what they did is they said, you know, the teachers are staying in the, uh, the classroom. If the students would like to leave to join the protest, they can do so once their parents give us a signed permission slip and their parents accompany them to the protest. So I think that's a very significant difference uh, than what was initially um, uh, considered and uh, I actually think it falls right in line with this decision. Yes, yes, definitely. And, and also, yes, as a, as, as a matter of fact, it's funny to follow up on what Judge McMahon was saying. The, the, the Department of Education, which is what it's called now, when they initially issued the order that Judge McMahon spoke about, saying that schools could take off, the kids could take off to go to this environmental protest, they actually tweeted this. We applaud our students when they raise their voices in a safe and respectful manner on issues that matter to them, showing that student action will lead us forward. Again, though, bear in mind, what would their response have been if the students wanted to take protest for something other than this? Again, perhaps for a conservative cause, or for any cause for that matter, with which maybe it didn't play so well in the city of New York, which again shows that the problem with what the Board of Education did, and as Judge McMahon indicated, Judge Tatone's decision apparently changed them, their attitude in this case, at the very last minute. May I interject at this point? Pardon? May I interject? Yes. Yes, yeah, sure. uh, and some other points, though, when we look at this historically, the perspective all the way to the climate change protest. And don't forget there also was a school being let out for uh, uh, the Million Women's March and then the Parkland Shootings March. But the Board of Education, two, two things were going on here as well. One, Mayor de Blasio was looking to run for president and his uh, uh, number one um, signature issue was going to be climate change. Number two, in place when this was happening, it was a policy of the Board of Education that no child was allowed to leave the school unless accompanied by a, a parent or a guardian. So on any given day, you can't just let a child leave the school. Back in 69, there was no such policy with the Board of Ed. So there was, there, there was that. So but the Board of Ed really had to grapple with, wait a second, we're, we're contradicting our own very own policy of child safety. I do want to point out that while you had hair back then, uh, <laughs> Judge Letty, that it, I think it, it might be worth noting that at the time that uh, Judge Tatone, my dad, was uh, hearing this case and writing the opinions, he was new to the bench. He was very new to the bench. Maybe they're a year tops. So I think that's worth noting. 1968, I know Judge Tatone, Judge Barlow, and Judge Garbarino were all uh, elected, and we were so delighted. We really were three terrific judges, and we were so glad to get them. I had the privilege of knowing Judge Tatone before he became a judge. That is Judge Tatone the first, although I knew the Judge Tatone the second, but they said when he was about <laughs> six years old. But uh, Judge Tatone the first, a terrific guy. I mean, absolutely terrific. We, we know that, and those of you who remember him and all, a superlative judge. Judge now, Betty, can I ask a question? I sort of remember this somewhat. <clears throat> And basically, the people that wanted to go simply just left the school. Now, would it have been different if basically the teachers were to say, if you wanted to go, it's on you? 
we're not going to give any exams, we're not going to give any homework. It's funny, I'm not sure, you know, because it, this was an official Board of Ed policy, right? But I'm just saying, if they did not do that. If they hadn't, if the teacher... If, if it was not, it seems to me what made this impermissible was the fact that it became an edict by the That's, Board of Education. Exactly, exactly, exactly. It's the nail on the head. Absolutely. Because I remember a lot of the kids would just leave. You remember leave. being told yeah. about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, I agree, 100%. Absolutely, exactly. absolutely. Right. It's, it's the government. It's the government. It's, it's, the government. it's the government giving a mandate of how to behave dealing with a very uh, hotly contested political issue. Now, the second case, again, is going to interest you, Staten Island kids, uh, even more so, this case, being from St. Peter's. Well, wait, before yes. we get to that second yes. case, yes. we still have a little time. <clears throat> so I just want to get a show of hands. How many think that that was the right decision? 69. 69. Show our hands again. How many, how many think that that was the right decision that was made? What happened in that case? <laughs> <laughs> they, ruled in, they ruled in favor of my clients. You got paid. You got paid. No, I didn't get paid. I did not get paid. I did not. If I was laboring in the vineyard of the Lord, as Bob Armory would say years ago. Remember Bob Armory years ago? <laughs> now, the second case can become even more of interest, I think, is Panarella against Birnbaum, which wound up going to the New York State Court of Appeals. And this is the, the facts of the case. By the way, the facts in, in this case, as in the first case, were undisputed. So I'm not making up facts. I'm not adding to them. These facts were there. They were agreed statements of facts. There was no trial in either one of these cases. It was just the presentation of the petition and the argument on the, writ of, on the, the Article 78 proceeding. It starts with a newspaper at Staten Island Community College called the Dolphin. And in the newspaper, the Staten Island Community College, they ran an article entitled the Catholic Church Cancer of Society, in which the Catholic Church was called the Holy Mafia, which acts like a social leech sucking the precious blood of society money. They call the saints neurotic masochists. They call Catholic schools the institutions of lunacy. And it went on, by the way. I mean, this is only some of it, right, of what they said. So um, the, the uh, article was aptly called by judges at every single level, it, it, it criticized the, 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 uh, the newspaper article in such terms as a virulent attack on the Roman Catholic Church, that was Judge Tatone speaking, a scathing attack on the, uh, on the Catholic Church, the appellate division. Um, the uh, Court of Appeals said derogatory, profane, and blasphemous. So again, the point I'm making is, this was not a disputatious article. This was not an article criticizing Catholic teaching. This was an article that was designed really to, to really inflame and, and to, to, to really put, make people out, outraged. And that's exactly what happened. Now, with this article, at the same time, about the same time, there was a newspaper at, called the Richmond Times, which was the newspaper at Richmond University which was a higher education facility here based in St. George. And they wrote uh, a column against attacking the Catholic Church, and Jesus Christ in particular. And I can't go into everything they say. I started to tell one of our panelists today, and she said, please don't even go any further. It was that bad. But so that I'm, I'm going to tell you how it began, because it was in black and white, and it was before the court. So this is, I'm not, again, so you understand what I'm talking about. This is how it went exactly. I'll never forget this. It began this way. Jesus Christ was reborn in the pussy of a black cat on the second floor bathroom of Richmond College. Master Bates shot in his pants at the site. And from that point on, it went downhill. It got worse and worse and worse. Right? Now, what happened was students came knocking on the door uh, Danny Panarella was, the, was a, uh, a, a student at Staten Island Community College, 17 years of age. He was unable to bring a lawsuit on his own right, so the lawsuit was initiated on, on, his, on his behalf by his father. Four boys, uh, actually three boys and a girl at Richmond uh, College, initiated a lawsuit 
uh, against Richmond University uh, because of the article that appeared in their newspaper. And the argument was a very simple one. The argument was that the First Amendment, as applied to the states through the 14th Amendment, mandates a neutrality with respect to religion. You can't favor religion, you can't be hostile to religion, government is, that is, can't, privately you can, but you can't, government can't do that. Now these newspapers had space on the campus of these public schools. They were financed by public funds. Their advisors were publicly paid. They were advertised in the handbook of the universities. And they each contained the seal of the City University of New York on the periodicals themselves. So the argument that we made was that even though these were written by students, they were in fact the arm of the government that was making these attacks on the Catholic Church, and therefore this violated the First Amendment, specifically the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, because the force of government was being used to attack religion, and in this case, the religion of, of these particular kids. And something else was going on too, by the way. The Board of Education had promulgated four or five years before its own guidelines concerning student newspapers. And part of those guidelines, I could read them to you, but time is getting late and I'm not going to go into all of it, but I can tell you, I can summarize it this way. It said that students' publications must keep in mind that they should not attack race people on the basis of race, religion, color, or creed, and that faculty advisors should make sure that they don't. So there was in place a provision for the administration to monitor the conduct of these student newspapers if they crossed the line and became racially insensitive or racially uh, uh, against a particular race or religion or whatever. So that was already in effect. So. Um, we initiated an Article 78 proceeding to force the colleges to, in effect, first enforce their own rules, and secondly, abide by the U.S. Constitution, the state constitution, and to stop them from, uh, in effect, subsidizing these attacks on religion. So the matter goes before my friend Judge Tatoni, <laughs> at, uh, when uh, Matthew's dad. And, um, yeah, and, 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 and by the way, there was a feeling that no, I, I, I had this feeling, and the kids had this feeling. The kids had the feeling that if it had been other religions, perhaps this article might not have been published. I mean, th that may not be legally an issue, and it really wasn't an issue legally, but that was part of what impelled the lawsuit here was that this was a great liberty that was being taken at the, against the Catholic Church that might not have been taken against other identifiable racial or religious groups, at least not to the extent that it was done here. So um, Ju Judge Tatone began by, by noting this. Here's what he wrote. Judge Tatone said, state power is no more to be used to handicap religion than it is to favor them. He was quoting from the Supreme Court's decision in Everson against the Board of Education. Now, he also quoted from Abington School District against Shemp, which is another seminal case in the church-state religion uh, issues. We agree, of course, that the state may not establish a religion of secularism in the sense of affirmatively opposing or showing hostility to religion, thus preferring those who believe in no religion over those who do believe. A manifestation of such hostility toward religion would be at war with our national tradition as embodied in the First Amendment's guarantee of the free exercise of religion. Judge Tatone also mentioned Engel against Vitale. Now, Engel against Vitale is another one of those key cases in which the U.S. Supreme Court ruled uh, on a church-state issue. This arose from the state of New York and involved a short 10-second non-denominational non voluntary prayer that, that, the public, that a public school district in New York used to start their school day and it was non-denominational in nature and strictly voluntary in nature. This was uh, challenged in court by a number of students who felt that notwithstanding they were allowed to remain silent or could step out, they still should not be in a position of having to, to do that. They shouldn't be in a position to have to be there or even stay outside while a, a, while a talk like this is, while a, a, uh, uh, you know, a prayer of this nature is being done. 
So the Supreme Court, a divided U.S. Supreme Court, agreed with them and said that this 10 second, even though it was short, even though it was voluntary, involved the government impermissibly entangled with religion, and in effect constituted an establishment of religion, and therefore violated the First Amendment. Now, Judge Titone cited the Vitale case in ruling in favor of the Staten Island petitioning students, and here's what he said. Let me just, let me, here's what he said. The court finds, again, we're talking about the Staten Island case, this Judge Titone's ruling. The court finds that property, facilities, and employees of the state and city of New York were used for an attack on religion, and further, that this violates the absolute neutrality required of these governments by the First and Fourteenth Amendments. The instant case is a more serious violation than the one in Engel against Vitale, where a 10-second recitation of an innocuous prayer requiring a scintilla utilization of public facilities was held to violate the Establishment Clause. Here, the use of public facilities is comparatively extensive, and an employee of the government, the faculty advisor, presumably devotes far more time to his advisory duties than the few seconds used by a teacher in reciting the Engel prayer. When these facts are added to the others set forth at the beginning of this opinion, it is seen that the imprimatur of the state is far more pronounced here than in Engel against Vitale. So Judge Titone issues an order telling the Board of Education to cease and desist and to stop using their student newspapers for attacks on religion. As a side note, by the way, and I've got to cut this short because I, I know Judge McMahon has more to add no, to this. No. Are you sure? No, go ahead. Keep on going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know you have to leave soon. That's why no, I'm going to do a Well, yeah, okay. Now, I'll tell you a side note of the story. Uh, Judge Atone was a great guy. I mean, I, I had the greatest Not respect for him. Well, this week, <laughs> he was in a play with me. I'm going to tell everybody when he was oh, 13, and then he gets you gone. <laughs> That's right. Every night we used to go to Brooklyn, I used to tell him stories on the way over there. <laughs> That's the truth. Ron, why are we doing this? <laughs> I would get that back, that gift. <laughs> so, so Judge Titone says, in Judge Titone at the end of his decision, said, submit order on notice, which is I guess every lawyer and every judge knows, it's, it's sort of commonplace. The judge issues a decision, then tells the lawyer, submit an order on notice, meaning submit an order embodying my decision, and I'll sign the order. So I submitted the order. Judge Tatone went out of his mind when the city submits an order dismissing the petition. He, I mean, he couldn't get over their goal. He <laughs> just got finished ruling against them, and they, now they submit an order like they won the case. He, he was like befuddled. I mean, I, I, it, took him, it took him five seconds to get angry, because he five seconds he couldn't believe they had done it. It was an astounding thing. So in any event, that's what happened with Judge Tatone. Now the city appeals, it goes to the appellate division. And the appellate division... Wait. How many agree with the decision so far? Okay. <laughs> Judge Titone, uh, the, God love Judge Titone. Beach <laughs> the, um, the city appealed to the appellate division, second department. The appellate division made it clear that it understood where Judge Titone was coming from, and this is what it said. The rationale, the rationale relied upon by special term is not without persuasion. As repeatedly articulated by the Supreme Court of the United States, the First Amendment mandates that the state maintain a strict neutrality, neither aiding nor opposing religion. Since these newspapers are published under the auspices of state-supported institutions, and since they are supported by public funds and afforded the use of public facilities, it may very well be argued that their publication constitutes a form of government activity. Then, however, the court shifted gears and said, notwithstanding all of that, they overturned Judge Tatone's ruling, finding that the newspapers, in fact, were neutral forms for the free expression of ideas. And they said that it wasn't really that the schools were against religion. They had set up a neutral forum in which people could exchange ideas. And in this particular case, they just happened to exchange those ideas in a way that was antagonistic to the Catholic faith. And so they, the appellate division overturned Judge Tatone's decision. Now, <coughs> excuse me, Judge Munda 
uh, who is, I think, based out in Long Island, wrote a dissent, a very, very strong dissent. And Judge M Mundus said he understood where the majority was coming from with respect to the dolphin. That's the case, the, the Catholic Church, of the, the, uh, the cancer society. But he completely disagreed with them on the Richmond Times article, which attacked Jesus Christ as being born in the pussy of the black cat going downhill from then on, as you remember that case. And uh, he said that the school had an obligation, at the very least, in the interest of maintaining decorum on campus and, and an orderly and efficient uh, atmosphere for the school to suppress the articles. Forget everything else, the article shouldn't have been published for that reason alone, because it threatened to upset the, the orderly operation of the school. So now we appeal to the New York Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals again divides in the case. The majority upholds the appellate division the, the decision, and the Court of Appeals, though, says, and, and this, I'm, I'm quoting the Court of Appeals, this must be so only if the, the Court of Appeals first says they recognize this is a collision between two primary constitutional pr uh, principles contained indeed in the same First Amendment. But then the Court said this. They took a slightly different approach from the appellate division. They said the reason why they would agree that Judge Tatone's order was incorrect was because the, this, there was no proof that this was a continuing course of conduct by the school in allowing continual attacks on the church. These were one-shot items. And this is what they, and Judge Breitella wrote the majority opinion said this. Only if the college's continued financial support to a newspaper systematically attacking religion over a period of time without balance might there be an attempt to establish a secular religion. The problem, though, if you think about this is, if Judge Breitel is right, if the appellate division is right, and if Judge Tatone is wrong, then the Board of Education's own rules are wrong. Because the Board of Education's own rules gave them the very right to do what Judge Tatone said they should be doing. And there's the problem, in a sense, if you think about it. I mean, you can't have one without the other. If Judge Tatone's wrong, then the Board of Education's own rules saying we can monitor the school paper is wrong, too. Judge now, Benny, yes. subsequent to that, there was that Brooklyn Museum case. I remember that. It was a famous case, and basically it was almost essentially the same thing, only thing it dealt with the Catholic Church being attacked right. in the Brooklyn Museum right. by the, um, the painting. painting. Yeah. The painting, like yeah. a urine or something in that painting. No, no, no. Camelot. Yeah. the Madonna. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah. something like that. And it, and it Did you want to speak more about that? No. Great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, thank you, I can use it. Um, one last thing before I sit down. Underlying all of this uh, on appeal, oh, by the way, there was a dissent in the Court of Appeals too. Judge Burke dissented in the Court of Appeals and said that he would have upheld Judge Tatone's ruling because, again, as Judge Munder had said in the appellate division, he felt that the school had an obligation in the interest of maintaining an orderly academic environment not to permit a newspaper like that, uh, an article like, to, like that, to go forward. And the appellate division too, by the way, this is an important point, Appellate Division said there was no proof that these articles threatened to disrupt the operation of the school. If there was evidence that it was going to up, disrupt the operation of the school, maybe they could have suppressed the articles, which raises this issue then. Maybe my clients, instead of coming in and suing the school, should have rioted in the school, right? I mean, maybe that's what they should have done. Because, and here's the very last thing I'm going to say, Behind all this is a very famous case called Tinker against the Des Moines School District. Now, Tinker stands for the proposition that children, that students do not leave their constitutional rights at the courthouse gate. This case involved a boy named Christopher, can I think of the name in a minute, Christopher, I forget his last name, Christopher and Mary Jane Tinker where these two kids decided to protest the war in Vietnam out in the Des Moines school district. And they got together and they were going to wear black armbands to school to protest the war in Vietnam. Well, the school found out about it. And the school contacted Christopher Porzelt, I think his name was. I'm going to get his name. I think, I think it's Porzelt. Porzelt. And, uh, and, and Mary Jane Tinker and said to them, you can't wear the black armbands to school. 
And so they said, oh, yes, we can. And they said, oh, no, you can't. And guess what? They showed up in school with the black armbands. So the school threw them out and suspended them and suspended them for three or four weeks, something like that. So they sued. And the US Supreme Court said that the black armbands were a form of symbolic speech that students did not surrender their right to speech at the courthouse gate and that the school acted improperly and unconstitutionally in not allowing them to wear the armbands. But there again, the rationale of the court was that there was no evidence that those black armbands were going to cause disruption of the orderly operation of the school. And the court implied, without actually saying that, if there had been such evidence of it, that might have been a different story. And again, that raises the issue of if a student feels aggrieved by something, are they better off just rioting rather than trying to, 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 to pro and, and, and lastly, this issue comes up over and over again today. If you look at the advance sheets from across the country, you'll see this over and over again. Most recently, I remember reading in one of the reports about that there was a, a, a day of sympathy for gay and lesbian youth, and they were wearing rainbow uh, outfits, and, and some kid walked in with a shirt that was very antagonistic to the gay and lesbian uh, transgender youth, uh, knocking them, calling them all kinds of you know, foul and lousy words and stuff like that, trying to incite a riot with that. And they actually suppressed that kid, made him take his shirt off. That kid turned around and sued. Now, I don't know what ever happened because I think the case is still pending. But this stuff goes on in schools all the time now. Because, and the administrators are damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. If they, if they stop the student from wearing the shirt or, or the symbolic speech, then they get sued. And if they don't stop them, they get sued. If there's a, an, an uproar, it ensues. So that's essentially what happens. And I've spoken way too long. Thank you so much for everything. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of programs over the last 30 years or so, but I think this is one of the most thought-provoking ones that we have had. So it was an excellent presentation, historical. That group was excellent as well. Judge, anything? Thank you. If anyone needs a CLE credit, you have to sign on the way out. Thank you all for coming, and we'll have another program in the spring.